Well, good morning, church. Vinings, if you will, stand to your feet with me. Before we kick this service off, I want to read a passage of scripture. This comes out of Psalm 99, verses 1 through 3, and it says, The Lord is king. Let the nations tremble. He sits on his throne between the cherubim. Let the whole earth quake. The Lord sits in majesty in Jerusalem, exalted above all nations. Let them praise your great and awesome name. Your name is holy. And so we're, we're proclaiming this big, massive gesture that we're reading here in Psalms but the beauty of this is God is all of those things, and he is our loving, caring father. He is the father that knows us and wants a relationship with us. And so this morning, we're going to be singing very closely to a cappella. And a cappella means in the style of the church. And so this morning, we're going to use our voices as the most honest and purest instrument there is, a God-created instrument inside of us to lift the praises, to lift our praises to the name of Jesus, to connect with the God who wants to be with us. Will you go there with me this morning? Let's go there with, let's go there this morning with Jesus. Heavenly Father, we love you and we praise you. Lord, this time is for you and you alone. Father, guide our hearts. Lead us where you want us to go this morning, God. Wherever you call us, may we follow. Lord, we know we're in your house. We are here in your presence, Lord. We love you and praise you. Amen. All right, church, we're going to do a little singing. Sometimes, sometimes on this journey, Get lost in my mistakes. What looks to me like weakness is a canvas for your strength. And my story isn't over, my story's just begun. Yep, but feel you want to find me, cause that's what my father does. Sing that line again. Feel you want to find me, cause that's what my father does. Oh. Arrival's not the end game. Come on, sing us out. Arrival's not the end game. The journey's where you are. And you never wanted perfect. You just wanted my heart. And the story isn't over. If the story isn't good. Yeah. This failure's never final when the Father's in the room. Sing that again. This failure's never final when the Father's in the room. Sing what happens when we come together in the Father's house under the banner of Jesus. We sing, Prodigals come home, right here. Let's go. Prodigals come home. Come on, church. The helpless find hope. Yeah. The love is on the move when the Father's in the room. Prison doors. Prison doors swing wide. Yeah. The dead come to life. The love is on the move when the Father's in the room. Miracles, miracles take place. The cynical find faith. The love is breaking through when the Father's in the Jericho. Jericho walls are quaking. Strongholds now are shaking. Love is breaking through when the Father's in the I said, love is breaking through. Shame at the door, cause it ain't welcome anymore. 
some praise this morning, church. Yeah.
and all hail King Jesus, yes God, and all hail the Savior of the world, all hail King Jesus, all hail the Lord of heaven and earth, all hail King Jesus, yes Lord, and all stripped away there's no flashing lights it's not a big band it's just God's people wanting to tell God that we love them just in this moment bow your head kneel over wherever you want but just take a minute to worship the Lord in prayer to speak to him maybe you need to settle your heart with some different things going on in your world, but just take a second to really connect with him, not just through a song, but talk to him, because he's in the room. Just take a moment, and I'll pray over us. Tell him thank you for the cross. Mm. But thank you for a loving relationship. Thank you for intimacy. Even now in this room, Lord, you're meeting with me just like you're meeting with everybody else, and it's just so personal. Oh, it's just so personal. I could sing of your love forever. love you, Lord. Continue to move in our hearts in a mighty way. May we be changed by the teaching of your word and time spent with you, God. So we're not just moved by something, but we're led to you. We're not just moved by a song, Lord, but we know that when you're speaking, we can know it's you because of the time spent with you. 
you and only you. Father, we love you. Thank you for being here in this place. In your son's name, amen. Amen, church. You may be seated. If you will, turn your attentions to the screen. Attention all middle school, high school students. It's now time for Epic Ministries, a student service just for you. Come meet me in the atrium. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Come on, give God some praise for what he's doing here. We've had an incredible, incredible two, three, four weeks here, and it's just been uh, unbelievable to see so many of you come to faith, embrace faith, uh, renew your faith, reconnect with the Lord. Um, Since Easter, I I just feel like there's a momentum here, and this last Friday night, we were able to celebrate with all of our Waymakers and um, just thank them, thank them for their service, because really, you and many of you serve you create the core here. Yeah, put your hands together for that. We, uh, you create the church that is now giving outside the walls of our church, and you create a, a church that can actually do the things that we're doing. 16 people led to faith, a few who are baptism, uh, attending baptism orientation. Some of you are going to get baptized even today. That's a surprise for later. Um, we are seeing amazing things here. I just want to thank all of you Waymakers who serve. And, and you may have noticed that we had a stripped back set today, stripped back uh, band. Every single person who plays here volunteers, and they have to get ready for songs every single week, right? We come late, right, because it's just songs, right? But they're here serving uh, three to five hours during the week and preparing these amazing songs. And so we just said, hey, guys, take the week off. Uh, We're going to let Tim kind of do an acoustic band, but it's a way for us to say thank you, thank you, thousand thank yous to all of you Waymakers who serve week in and week out. Another announcement that I kind of want to share with you, um, oh, by the way, I I wanted to tell you guys that it was a cowboy night, and we like had all these um, games, parlor games, and it was kind of like all country western, and I had a cowboy hat on, everybody, you know, everybody who has a cowboy hat, it was really fun, really, really incredible. So see, you need to be a Waymaker. Uh, you'll get to join us for a murder mystery or something like that. We've, we've murdered some people here on uh, Friday nights, uh, done a murder, murder mystery for our Waymaker appreciation. You never know what we're going to do for Waymaker appreciation, but uh, this upcoming uh, hour, I want to kind of make this a little bit short today because I've got a surprise there at the end that I've kind of already let out of the bag, but at, at 1230, um, you're going to get to find out why I have uh, bloody and body parts up here on the stage. If you're curious about that, why does he have that? I'm going to be talking about that uh, in the hour at 1230 in the theater. Those of you who were at the newcomers lunch last week, I talked about how we're going to do that over the next few weeks, and you're welcome to come. Um, and then finally, finally, <laughs> finally, uh, next week, we are going to be uh, launching a series on anxiety and stress, and depression as well. Uh, you guys remember the survey that we did a couple of weeks ago on Easter Sunday, and you were able to give us various topics that um, you'd like for us to talk about over the course of the year. We've got our plans and everything. Don't worry, we're not flying blind, but um, we wanted you to inform that. And far and away, the number one uh, topic was stress and anxiety. And so we want you to know that I'm going to be going into deep, deep into God's Word to speak about that over the next couple of weeks. Um, I'm already in study, kind of preparing for that. that. We were going to launch it today, but we decided to delay it a week because we really wanted to do this today uh, and and talk about uh, something, a a very important topic, a very important, um, it's it's, it's true for all of us, uh, steps that we need to take with the Lord. But next week, I'm going to launch that. And so don't miss it. We're going to be going through the life of Elijah and uh, I I realize some of you guys, I was just reading over it and praying over it just before I came out here. Um, that many of you guys have, may have a smile on today, 
but you're dealing with very, very difficult issues in your life. And so just know we're going to be praying and uh, studying God's word to prepare some messages for you on the anxiety, stress, and even mild depression. If you struggle with depression, you don't want to miss this. Or if you have a friend who struggles with depression or anxiety in any way, worry in any way, make sure that they're here over the next couple of weeks. So with that said, I want to go ahead and launch today. Uh, Again, I mentioned that there's a surprise at the end, and because we're doing a different kind of day at the end of our day, uh, we won't have that giving moment that we usually have. And we know a lot of you like to worship through giving. That's one of your most, uh, uh, that's your most spiritual moment. And so uh, we just want to say thank you for everybody who gives generously. If you're a first time guest or new to our church, um, we don't invite you to give. We just invite you to enjoy Jesus and, and, and interact with him and, and begin to understand why it is that some people might actually put him first in, in their finances. Thank you to all of you who do that. You enable ministry here. And, and those who place their faith in Christ over the few weeks, uh, those who've been invited and are filling up our Jesus wall with, with lights um, are empowered because uh, of your generosity. And so the three different ways that you can give are at this kiosk. Some of you can give physically. You like to give physically. Others of you give through the app, and that's where the majority give through the app. You can also set up recur- excuse me, recurring giving. Thank you, thank you, thank you for being a generous church. Those of you who are, are generous and, and empower ministry here, you are making such a difference. We've just fought uh, a lot. We've dug wells and and, and, and fought domestic violence together, and, and uh, there's, some of the money goes to church plants and fighting street trafficking. Thank you for your generosity. So let's put our hands together for the end of our This Is Jesus series. It's been a great series. We have been going through the last six weeks, and today I am wrapping up that, um, that, that series. There's one thing I forgot to mention. We're going to be the reason why these body parts are out here is we're talking about what it means to be the church, not do the church at 1230. So if you want to learn what it means to be the church, not do church, and really understand the why behind the what and search the scriptures together, we're going to be going through that at 1230 today. And uh, I encourage you to, to bypass your lunch plans and come to that, man. Come on, let's, let's go for it. So uh, today, as I said, we're finishing up this series and I'm entitled today, All In. All in. And I want to launch this today uh, with a framework, a verse, Jeremiah 29, 11, if we could throw that up there, that God has plans for you. Did you know that? God has, and he knows that they're clear in his mind. He's not ambiguous. He's not confused about what his plans are for you. You're just confused about what his plans are for you. But the, pro- the thing is, he's got it clear in his mind. I know the plans that I have for you. And guess what? I'm a great communicator. You think I'm a bad communicator because, you know, I don't necessarily talk the way that you're, you know, uh, the way that you would maybe like me to talk. But guess what? I made communication. I invented communication. I'm the creator of communication. Communication wouldn't exist if I hadn't made it a part of creation and included it as a part of creation. So I can communicate. The issue is, will you spend time with me? Will you go that next step with me? Will you, will you take your, your relationship with me seriously and go for it with me? And he says, I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a what? A future. I know the future that I have for you. I know what I want. I want to give you a hope. I want you to have something to hope for in your earthly life. But so many of you are dealing with just the entanglements of a life that's far from God of just not, not connected, not communicating with God. Maybe it's even sin or addictions that you struggle with. And because you keep dabbling in these things, because you think that you know better, you continue to deal with, ah, I don't even know what the point is of this life, and you don't know what your purpose is. He says, here's how you find it. Just ver- two verses later, he says, here's how you get there. Verse 13, you will seek me and you will find me. This is just two verses later. When you seek me wholeheartedly, and that's the issue. Will you go all in? on this relationship with me, because I know the plans that I have for you. I know the future. I want to give you a hope because, hey, there's coming a day when I'm going to come back a second time and I'm going to sort out everything and everything's going to make complete sense, okay? And there's an arc, a meta narrative throughout from Genesis to Revelation of where things are headed towards. And I've included you in on it. I had you be born right now in this time. And I know the plans that I have for you. I know your future, but will you seek me? There's a condition. I'm not going to tell you my plans. I'm not going to tell, I'm not going to reveal your whole future unless, and it's a big unless, unless you seek me. You say, well, I thought Christianity was unconditional. It is. Beginning a relationship with God is completely unconditional, right? Because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross, we place our faith in Jesus Christ alone for our salvation. It is by grace through faith that we've been saved and 
by grace alone that we've been saved, not our effort, not our good deeds. We're saved unconditionally. You don't even have to maintain your salvation through your good deeds. It was based on Jesus Christ's uh, death on the cross alone, 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 that you are saved. But there is your future and you living out God's plans for you is conditional. Whereas your salvation and your relationship with him is unconditional, you living out God's plan for your life, you knowing your purpose and learning that from him and hearing that from him and actually living it out, that's entirely conditional. And it's conditional upon this. Are you wholehearted? Are you going all in? You say, I'd be the first to say I'm a Christian. Are you all in? Are you going at this wholeheartedly? Here's a question. How are you growing since your decision to follow Jesus? How are you growing? How are, you, are you embracing what God has for you? Here's a, something I want to say. While your salvation, let's throw that up there. While your salvation will always be free, you will not experience, can we throw that up there? While your salvation, it's not working today. There we go. While your salvation will always be free, you will not experience blessings unless, in your life unless your life is in a blessable position. This may be a new word for many of you. That your life, look, it's, is your life something that I can bless sexually? Is your life something that I can bless financially? Is your life something I can bless with your addictions that you continue to struggle in and you dabble in alcohol or you dabble in marijuana or you're dabbling in CBD and, and you, know, you kind of go for that when you're dealing with, dealing with your worry and anxiety? And we're going to talk about a much better way of handling that next week. But are you, is it, are you positioned in a way that I can bless you? I know you have faith in Jesus. I know you believe Jesus is the son of God. We're not talking about your eternal life. We're talking about your earthly life. And the reason why you're not experiencing me, the reason why you deal with confusion is because you think, well, because Jesus saved me, I don't have to do anything. And you don't to get his love. But you do in order to experience all that God has for you. You won't get the blessing until you're blessable. And this is true in every area of life. Are you willing to position your life to go all in, to really seek him wholeheartedly in the area of your relationships? And forgiveness. You know that God says, hey, I need you to forgive. It's more for you than it is for, for others. You could even say that to me, but you're not forgiving and you're eating up with bitterness. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, anyway, it's, it's, it's uh, over and over in, our, in the areas of our life. We continue to believe, but well, since I don't have to earn or even maintain God's love, then everything's okay. I don't have to do. Nothing could be further from the truth. And I grew up thinking, I grew up believing that you know, if I follow Jesus with all my life, that my life wouldn't be very fun. If I went all in, then, you know, it's going to be a boring life. God is not the God of fun and God won't. Listen, nothing could be further from the truth. That is just a lie from hell. In fact, the more that you go after the things that God, outside of God's design, the more you're going to be entangled with sin, the more that you're going to be confused about what God's will is, and the less time that you're going to have for fun. In fact, if I were to find out that Jesus Christ, um, I, I like to say it this way, and some of you have heard me say this before, that Jesus Christ didn't rise from the dead. If I found out that it was all a hoax and that Jesus Christ really wasn't who he said he was and he didn't rise from the dead, I would still, I've been walking with Jesus so long, I would still do everything that the Bible says because I have more time. Look, my marriage is great. My kids, they're growing up great, right? I want, they're, they're experiencing everything I want for them. They value school. They value you know, the, the things that I want them to value. Um, I'm not dealing with any addictions. Um, I'm not divorced. I, I, you know, my sex life, I, I, I experience great sex. You should know that, as I should, right? Because, hey, you, you pursue sexual purity. You experience the best kind of sex in, in, in marriage. Hey, I am blessed. If I found out that the whole thing was a sham, I would still do my life exactly the way that God says. Because you know what? Hey, there's blessing on the other side. And I actually have a whole lot more fun. Just ask the single mom who said, you know, to heck with that whole dating non-Christians thing, non, not dating non-Christians thing. Uh, I, I, I'm going to date whoever I want to, whoever I fall in love with, only to find out that that guy wasn't really pursuing Jesus. And now she wakes up and comes in here every single Sunday, you know, and leaves her, her husband in bed every, every week because he's not pursuing the Lord. He doesn't give a thing about and care about the mission of God. Um, or, or uh, you know, to heck with that sex before marriage thing. Right? I'm just going to have sex with whoever I want because I don't, I don't trust God. I don't believe that what God's... I think he's trying to steal fun from me only to find out that if you have sex before marriage, if you have 
you know, if you're sexually active before marriage, if you're dating a guy who's pressuring you sexually, only to find out that after I get married, um, once he gets bored with me, he goes and he pursues a, an exciting outlet elsewhere. And he had an affair on me. See, now she wakes up every morning as a single mom, having to work, right? And having to deal with her kids and trying to grow up her kids and, and, and de- uh, grow them up into maturity without a dad in the home. And that dad has to wake up every single day uh, in a house that's separate from his kids. See, is life without God more fun or less fun? <laughs> God, listen, God is the God of fun. He, is, he invented it. He made it, okay? That's what I love about the chosen is that, you know, you see the side of the personality of Jesus that's there in the Bible and it's there the whole time. He is a sanguine, man. Part of the image of God is, is to joke and to laugh and have fun and play with kids. Like, that's what, that's what you find Jesus doing. But when we get out here in, the, in, in, in our, our, our world and we think, ah, God's, not, God's out for stealing fun, we misunderstand God completely. Is your life blessable? Have you put your life in a blessable position? And one of probably the greatest revelations that I've, I've realized in my faith journey as I've been walking with Jesus, okay, is that I must do the, do the things that God says in order to experience the blessing. And you say, well, I don't feel like it. You say, huh, I, I don't want to. I, I'm just, just not into it. You say, well, that's like me talking to my kids on, 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 in the morning, you know, to get up to go to school. Um, I, I say, you know, it's time to get up. It's time to go to school. They say, well, I, I don't want to get out of bed. It's, too, it's warmer underneath my, my comfort. I say, you need to get out of bed. You need to go to school. Now, most of the time, it's, they don't want to go to bed at night, so now they're really tired, okay? And it's, a, it's more of a labor to get them to go to bed uh, than it is to get them to wake up. But I'm like, no, you're going to go to school. Well, I don't want to go to school. It's too hard there, and they keep, they keep challenging me, and they give me too much homework. And then, listen, this is for you. This is for your good. You need to go to school. Well, well you're torturing me, making me get up and, and, and go to school. Call it whatever you want, torture, whatever name that you have for it. I'll waterboard you if I need to to get you to go to school, right? And what do they say after at 25? What, what does every single kid say? See, you don't know this because you're a young parent and you're, still, you're not there yet. But when your kid is 25, what, what are they going to say to you? Thank you for getting me up. Thank you for helping me go to school. Now I can get scholarships to go to college or I can get into the, school, the college that I wanted to. Now I have opportunities. Now I have you know, career that I can have and make money the way that I want to make money because you got me up. See, the blessing comes on the backside of putting your life in a blessable position. James said it this way, do not be hearers of the word, be doers. Do not be hearers only, be doers of the word. James would be the first to say, hey, you've placed your faith in Jesus as your savior. You've got a relationship with him. Wonderful. That's awesome. But is your life blessable? If you want to experience him in your earthly life, you've got to put your life in a blessable, blessable position. That means doing what he says do, even if you don't feel like it. I was um, talking with the staff, and I, I just feel like I'm laboring sometimes as we're launching this church because it feels like three steps forward, two steps back, three steps forward, two steps back. And a lot of it is watching people who place their faith in Christ, they get back out in the world. They don't do as God says, and then their life gets all tangled up. And then it's, well, you know, I don't know if I have time for church because now their life's gotten a whole lot more confusing and they're more, more just, just, it takes time to deal with all the, you know, just the, the extras that I've just already, already shared. And I said, you know what? If we didn't care about them, <laughs> this is gonna sound weird. If we didn't care about the people who were leading, you know, it'd be a whole lot easier to do church because we could just hold services from 11 to 1230 and just have a really powerful sermon and, you know, powerful worship and then, you know, have an awesome kids ministry, but not think of them, not have to think about them for the rest of the week because, Hey, and it would be cheaper too, right? We wouldn't have as much programming and, and things to do. Did you know that if we didn't care about you, didn't care about you actually applying some of the things that God has said to do post the cross, post placing your faith in Christ, it'd be a whole lot cheaper, it'd be a whole lot easier, but we do care about you. And that's why we labor. And it feels like I'm laboring like a, a mom in labor. And I know I didn't go through labor, but I've got a story for you in just a minute. But we, it just feels like I'm, I'm laboring for you. I want to show you one more verse before we dive into kind of my main text. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. Ephesians says this. Let me clarify the gospel, okay? Because some of you, because you're predisposed to religion and you're predisposed to, well, God just, he's got something behind the curtain. He says it's for free, but after I get behind the curtain, he's going to require all these things of me and, and I've just got to start doing. And, and you're kind of, you think this is a religion that we're leading you to? 
Um, you, need, you need to hear this, okay? It is by grace that you have been what? Past tense. It's over. Past tense. How did you get that? You got it through belief, through faith. I've placed my faith on, we talked about two weeks ago, placed my faith on Jesus Christ alone. I don't even believe it's Jesus Christ plus my good deeds that gets me salvation, right? Why? Because it says, and this is not from yourselves, not a bit of it comes from you. It is the gift of God, look at this, not by your works, not by your good deeds that you're saved. You are saved, it's been completed, and you got that through belief and belief alone. You got the what? You got the grace, the grace that came from the cross, the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. That's what gave you the grace. So it is a gift that's given to you, not by works, so that you can't take pride in it, so that you can't say, I saved myself. And Jesus had to do a lot of the work, but you know, I had to do some of the work too. I, I kind of earned my salvation too. None of us can boast. But look at the very next verse. This is the very next verse. He says this, even though you've been saved completely and it's for free and you don't even have to maintain your salvation through your good deeds, we are God's workmanship. For we are God's workmanship. Those of us who are saved created in Christ Jesus to what? To get to work. To get to work. We've got a mission. We've got something he wants us to do. You've got a purpose. He's got plans for you. He's got a future for you, just like in the Old Testament. The Old Testament's synonymous with the New Testament. I've got plans for you, but you know what? That's entirely conditional. You experiencing the earthly blessings that I want for you and all of the life of purpose that I have for you, that's entirely conditional. Salvation, unconditional. You don't even have to do anything to maintain my love. I'm going to love you. You're in heaven. You're in eternity when you die. That's a certainty, certainty, certainty. And it's not based on you. It's based on the completed work of Jesus Christ on the cross. But you living out what I want for you, you experiencing everything that I have for you, that's completely conditional about whether you believe me in the area of your addictions, in the area of your relationships, in the area of your friendships, and whether you choose to have Christian friendships as your closest friendships, and whether you embrace God's mission for the church, sir, whether you embrace that God has a plan to include you in the church, God has a plan for you in the church, and it is my plan A for the world, but you're missing out, all because you think church is a place that I go and sit for one hour a week and sit on four-inch four padded cushions. You know, they're lucky I'm there. I mean, I'm blessing, their, blessing them with my presence. You are not blessing anyone with your presence. This is something for you. We got to get out of our entitlement mentality, and I am looking at you. The reason why you are where you are spiritually is because of that attitude. You think you're blessing us. And sometimes you sit, now I'm, I'm talking to myself. I know this is stiff. I know it's hard, but we got to hear this. Sometimes you, you sit back with, on a sermon like this and, and you put it in, and it's like, well, let's see what he's got today. Let's see if it's any good. Bless me if you can, Pastor. And God says, okay. You might be saved. I don't know if you're saved or not. Only God knows whether you're saved. You might be a believer in Jesus Christ, but that is not the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. That is not the attitude that a Christian has. And while you may be eternally secure, only God knows, I can't give you any assurance of your salvation. I just can't. This isn't about you just believing in Jesus Christ as your Savior and then not letting Christ do his work in you. That God has some handiwork, verse 10, let's throw that back up there, that I've, I've, I've prepared in advance for you to do, excuse me, in Jesus, created in Jesus Christ to do good works, which God prepared in advance for you to do. I've got a role for you to play in the story of God. No wonder you're confused. You thought your purpose was just to embrace Jesus Christ as your Savior. You thought all it was was I need to place, you know, make sure that I'm not going to hell. Only God knows whether you're actually not going to hell. I can't give you any assurance of your salvation. Don't, don't be looking for that for me. The way I can give you assurance of your salvation is the Holy Spirit does, begins to do a work and begins to bear fruit. You find yourself wanting to trust him in more and more areas of your life and even in areas where you don't necessarily, it doesn't make sense to you. I don't know why he would ask me to do that with sex. I don't know why he'd ask me to get out of my addiction. I don't know why he'd ask me to love my wife like Christ loved the church. And you begin to trust him in areas where even if it doesn't make sense to you because he has a role for you to play, something that he's prepared in advance for you to do. I decided that you'd be born right now in this century. I decided Peter would be born back 20 centuries ago. I decided that 
Abraham would be born 20 centuries before that. I decided every single person would be born at a certain time because I've got something for you to do. And there's a future to this story. And there's a second coming to this story. And there's all the things that are going to roll out in the book of Revelation. But that's still future. We plan as though it's going to still be future. We live and we hope as if it's today. But we got a plan as if we're going to live our entire 80-year life. What are you doing, right? What, what are, are you engaging with your heavenly father to find out what he has for you, what his plans are for you? Because he gave you the personality he gave you, not by chance. He gave you the gifting that he gave you, not by chance. He gave you the family of origin that you have or, or lack of family of origin, right? You may not like the parents that you have, but he gave you the parents that you had and background and all the home that you grew up in for a reason, because he's got good works for you to do in advance. And it feels like labor sometimes as a pastor. I could be honest with you, to, 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 to help you see, if I could just plead with you, this is what James was talking about in his book. This is what Jesus was talking about on the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are you, blessed are you, blessed are you who do, who do, who do. And then look at this in Galatians 4, 19, it says this. Paul is, is talking, he says, my dear children, he, said, he begins to talk to them, not, this isn't a derogatory term. This is like, I, I see you as my kids, kind of like I am with my kids trying to get them to go to school. I'm the papa of this church, Paul is saying, the church in Galatia, and, and you're, you're like my kids, and I'm just trying to, listen, you have salvation for free. I've been so clear on that in this book, okay? Galatians is all about that. But now it's time to, you know, do the works and begin to obey God the way, disentangle yourself with all the, just the, just the crap that, that sin brings into your life and the consequences of sin, and, and it feels like I'm in labor pains, he says, in the labor pains of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. And if I could be honest with you, just absolutely, you know, completely, as if I'm not honest all the time. I don't, it's, just a, it's just an expression. But it feels like I'm laboring, going through labor to birth, you know, a group of believers who actually do, who actually do, who actually go, I, I want all that God has for me, I, I was, um, we were, we, you know, that Elizabeth and I have been married for 23 years and um, we have three kids and there was a time when we had three, three and under and it just felt like toddler city and pee and drool and milk was everywhere all over my house. And I was kind of talking about it with one of my mentors and he said, you must really like kids. I said, no, I actually just really like my wife. <laughs> and that's, that's, an old, that's a pastor joke, but um, I do really like my wife. And um, we, were, we were a baby factory at one point, and um, we had three kids, and, um, just, and now they're kind of getting to middle, be middle school age. But nothing was more challenging than giving birth to our firstborn. We went in on Monday morning, and it was uh, Pitocin time for those of y'all who've had babies, and they were going to induce labor, and, and the contractions were so far apart. And every time there would be a contraction, I would hold her hands and we just kind of get through it together. I'd be taking Lamaze classes and, you know, kind of trying to be a good husband and really kind of, well, there was two hours of this and I was thinking the baby would be here by now. And it was four, four hours of this. We're getting to six hours. It's noontime. We started this back at 6 a.m. It's noontime and the baby still isn't here and the contractions are more, more regular. And it was so exhausting. And I was like, honey, I need a nap. Can I like lay down on that little bench over there? <laughs> She's the one giving labor. And, but, but she actually let me go get a nap because it was just, it looked like it was still going to be another two to four more hours. Well, about 10 hours passes by and I didn't nap very much. So don't, don't, don't see negligent husband here. But anyway, um, the, 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 the 10 hours into this, the, the doctor comes in and says, we've got to do an emergency C-section. And sir, I need you to sign this because, you know, the, the umbilical cord is wrapped around your son's uh, throat and, and, and the placenta's coming off and your, your wife's internally bleeding and she might die and, and, and I need you to sign this. And as I read, because I'm just like my hand's shaking while I'm, while I'm signing this, it's, we are not liable for your wife's death. We are not liable for your child's death. And so, you know, emotionally draining. Well, 15 minutes later, I'm praying on a bench. 15 minutes after that, I'm walking into a room where she's laid out and there's a curtain and, and I'm seeing one half and this is the part that I know and love. This is, looks like some from horror movie and bloody mess like, like this over here. And I'm like, don't let me see that side. I'm going to go to this side. And I'm helping her through this and, and we're talking through this. Thank God she had an epidural in her at this point and, and, and she's not feeling anything. But we're both kind of fearful because we don't know. It's uncertainty. We don't know. It's just labor. 
And then finally, 10 minutes later, the baby, I, we hear the baby crying. And, and they say, sir, it's time for you to film. And, I, and we film this. I film this. And, and it's the most beautiful joy to see your child. And all the past 12 hours, they just washed away. Why? Because of the joy of what we had, right? This is my son. Wow. And the labor was worth it. Can I be honest with you? That's the way I feel sometimes as a believer, because you see, as a, as a pastor, because I, 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 walk, I see you walk out into the world and, and you don't take seriously what our heavenly father has said about the design of this world. He says, look, you're, you're sitting in the middle of something that I designed. I designed all of it, okay? Think cliffs and waterfalls and, 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 and you're the air that you're breathing, everything, the chemical uh, makeup of, of the air that, that feeds your body and, and the stuff that grows from the ground. All of this was made by a designer, okay? And the food that you eat. I designed it all, and I'm telling you how I designed it. And when you operate out of my design, when you, when you just kind of say, ah, I love the Jesus as my savior part. I'm going to believe you about that. But when it comes to your you know, sex life or, or dating life or, or, or whatever it is, um, I'm just not going to do it your way. He goes, ah, oh, you're not going to experience all that I have for you. And no, you're not saved by that. And no, you're not going to go to hell if you don't do it, right? Because Jesus Christ, on, that's it's, it's what he went to the cross for, but you're going to have to now walk through the consequences and stuff that I just don't want for you. And I watch person after person after person after person walk away from this church and walk away from Jesus because of this. So what I want for you, for those of you who have never taken the first step of following him, we say, what's the first step? The first step of following him, post-placing your faith in Christ is baptism. It's, it's you saying to the, to the world, I have decided to follow Jesus as my Savior, and I don't care who knows it. You know, just put, put me out there. I'm not ashamed of Jesus. I'm not ashamed of being associated with Jesus. And what's he doing? He's helping you walk through the whole process, get, getting rid of that shame of being associated with Jesus because he's called me out of the matrix. He's called me out of this, this world as we see it, and he's called me to a new nation, a new society, a new people. And my prayer for you today is that if you've never been baptized, you say, I've been a believer for 30 years. It'd be so weird if I got baptized now. God's will for you today is to be baptized. And it could be that this is the watershed thing for you that's holding you back from saying yes in other areas of your life because you've not truly decided, I'm gonna follow Jesus. Even when he asked me to do something that doesn't make sense, getting wet. What's the point of me getting wet and looking dumb in front of all those people with my hair slicked back? You know, you might be worried about your hair getting slicked back and I'll look dumb if I have my hair slicked back in front of all those people. What's the point of all that? I just don't see it. And since I don't see it, I'm not gonna do it. He says, okay. This, you have no idea. You're, you're not on the other side of the blessing. You don't know, you, you're not going to ever know the blessing of being baptized and what I'm going to do for, for you and in your heart and through you with that because your life isn't in a blessable position. I mean, I could close in prayer right now. I mean, that's, that's the whole thing for you. It's God's will for you to be baptized. You say, I was baptized as an infant. Uh, that was an extremely emotional moment and very, very important for your parents because they were dedicating you as a baby. If you were not baptized as a believer, and that's why we talk about believer's baptism, if you did not actually believe, and none of us believe before four and a half years old, we won't even baptize you here if you're five and under and you, you confess Christ, because it's gotta be a, a choice of your own will, placing your faith in Christ. We make sure that they're, that they're truly, uh, it's a real believer's um, baptism that we do here. But if you were baptized as an infant, that does not count. That was an extremely important moment for your parents, but it wasn't for you. And if you were baptized as an infant, then you need to be baptized of your own volition, of your own choice. You say, what's up with this whole baptism thing? It comes from this word baptizo, to dip, to dunk, to immerse, um, to, to go fully under the water. It, was, it wasn't a spiritual word. It was a word in the Greek, that's where it came from, um, that was just used in common everyday language. It was used to take a swim. Or he went and took a bath and, and, and went into the middle of the river, or went into the middle. They went and swam in the, the, the Mediterranean Sea, and they baptizo themselves. Some of them went underwater. Um, it's even used in cooking recipes. And I looked up this old ancient cooking recipe. We've got all this writing from the first century. And uh, it said that you dip the cucumber in the vinegar, you baptizo the cucumber. It wasn't a spiritual word. 
It's just kind of a normal, everyday word. And it says uh, at the end of this recipe, just a little fun thing. It says, and you leave the cucumber in the vinegar for six weeks. <laughs> I, I, I couldn't believe it. So I had to uh, check that out and find out from my, my, my mom. She, she has made pickles. And I said, hey, mom, do you, they really leave the cucumber in there for six weeks? She said, yeah, sometimes I leave it in there for eight weeks. It, 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 sometimes it tastes even better that way. And I said, well, that's the problem. That's why I can't get these Christians to walk with God. When I baptize them, I don't leave them under long enough. So maybe if I leave them under long enough, like it'll really stick and they'll actually really begin walking with Jesus, right? And I was like, you know, it, it, it's just amazing. So anyway, uh, baptizo, what they did, John comes on the scene and he's the last Old Testament prophet. He's the, one, the last one before Jesus. And what he's doing is he's preaching a message of prepare the way. I'm preparing the way, so you need to prepare your heart. Prepare your heart. And he used the word repent. Circumcise your heart so that you're ready, so that when the Savior of the world is in front of you, you'll be able to see him because the kingdom of God is near. The kingdom of God is at hand. And he was preaching a message of prepare your heart for what's about to come. And anybody who responded to his message, he'd do something that had never been done in history up to this point. He dunked him. Up until this point, there had been people who'd taken baths and they backed down into a mikvah. Uh, the Jews would back themselves, but they would baptize themselves. No one, no historical account ever shows anybody baptizing another person. And people saw what he was doing and they'd go, he's, he's, what is that? He's baptizoing them. That was, well, it wasn't a spiritual word. And so Baptist isn't his last name. It's just, he's just the John the baptizer. And they would talk about him when they left the, the, the Jordan River. They'd go back to Jerusalem and, have, hey, have you seen John? He eats locusts and honey. He's out. He's pre- preaching him. He says the kingdom of God is near. He says that we're about to see the Savior. Um, he's like baptizing people. I'm calling him. I don't even know who his dad is. So John the baptizer. And that's how he got his name. And then one day Jesus walks up and he says, uh, I want you to baptize me. And what's Jesus doing? He's saying, I'm entering into the Old Testament prophecies about me. And he's saying they're all one God. And what I'm about to do over the next three years, because this is going to inaugurate his public ministry, is I'm going to link your message, John, and all of the Old Testament to what I'm about to do. Three years later, he would die. He says, no, uh, John the Baptist says, no, I need to baptize you. If everybody knew who you really were, I need to be baptizing you. Not, not, not excuse me, uh, <laughs> you need to be baptizing me, not me, not me to you. He says, J- Jesus says, no, this is the way. This is what God has already foreordained. You need to baptize me. Well, Jesus, he preaches the message of the kingdom throughout the next three years. And he says, look, the kingdom of God is near. And those of you who have eyes to see, let him see. Those of you who have ears to hear, let him hear. And those who believed in his message, now Jesus is baptizing people. And then he, at the end of his three years, he dies. He's resurrected, walks around for 40 days, appearing to over 500 people. And at the end of those 40 days, he says to his guys, I want you to go and make disciples, and then what? Teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you, and baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Our Savior then commands the 12, hey, you go out and preach the message. Lead people to faith in me, and before they start following me, first thing they need to do is you baptize them, and you teach them that baptism is a symbol, a symbol of entering into my death and entering into my resurrected life. Because they die to themselves, and then the water is like an image of sin coming off of them, the the forgiveness of sins, and now they're resurrected because the Holy Spirit, who I'm about to send, is going to be inside of each and every individual one, empowering you to do it. Look at this. Baptism demonstrates to the whole world, you've united yourself with Jesus in the same way that Jesus is is living out resurrected life, you're you're resurrected life, and now Jesus can live his life through you. That's what vine and branch means. Live his life through you. Baptism is a mark that you put on yourself and I'll pers- that I'll pursue growth and obedience in all the areas of life that God speaks to. It's the first act of obedience and it says, I'm going to follow you. It's a, it's a stake in the ground. It's that moment that you remember forever that says, you know what? I'm not going to dabble in sin anymore. I'm not going to dabble in, it's not just sin. Like, I'm going to dabble in living contrary to the way that God says, the, the designer says. And from now on, I'll never be the same. I may not be perfect. I'm not going to be perfect, but I'm going to endeavor to learn how to walk in his ways according to his design. And I'm putting a stake in the ground in this moment that I'm going to obey him when it comes to baptism. I'm not gaining or completing my salvation through this baptism. That was done on the cross. But this is about me and a relationship with me and my heavenly father that 
dabbling in my relationship with God is over. Today, I have decided to follow Jesus. I'm getting baptized, even if I don't understand it completely, just like there's plenty of other areas in my life that I don't fully understand why he'd say do this or don't do that. The blessing comes on the other side of putting your life in a blessable position. And I'm telling you, you won't get picked off. Baptism, finally, it says, it lets the whole world, I'm not ashamed. Can I just be, I've kind of been pretty strong, stiff with you so far. Can I be even more stiff? If you don't want to get baptized, let's just, he says, either be hot or cold, but don't be lukewarm. Let's just, let's just be cold, okay? Here's what you need to admit. You're ashamed of Jesus. He bled for you. You can't get your hair wet. You say, well, I, I've got lunch after this. I, 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 then tell Martha or Aunt Barry or whoever's putting the roast on, right? Tell them I'll be 10 minutes late because I'm getting baptized today. You say, well, we got, we got plans. And, and, and if I go to a restaurant and I have slick hair, then, then what do I do then? Then you'll be telling the whole restaurant. I've decided to follow Jesus because I'm not ashamed anymore. I'm not ashamed anymore. I, I got the t-shirt on and then we're going to give you a t-shirt today if you get baptized. Listen, I want you to get past all of your excuses. If you know that if you walk out of here today, if you've never been baptized and you're like days into this, I, 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 everybody who's placed their faith in Christ has never been baptized needs to get baptized today. If you walk out of here today and you say, well, I, I, I've got this or that and I've got all these excuses to, to why I, I don't need to, need to be baptized, okay? You're gonna come out, <laughs> you're gonna leave and you're gonna find a second and a third and a fourth and a fifth excuse. It's, just, it's back out into the world into the same excuses for why you've never been baptized. You say, I'm too fat. I'm not going to put myself inside of, inside of that tank. Listen, sir, ma'am, we have the biggest tank. I bought the biggest tank I could possibly buy so that you could get baptized. If you're overweight, don't worry about it. Follow him. Turn your heart to him. When there was, the church was getting started, these 12 they went out after Jesus said, make disciples and go and baptize everybody. Peter gets up on a, on a wagon in Jerusalem. The Holy Spirit's come, it's 50 days after. And he begins to preach the same message, just of love, a God's love for you. And 3,000 people place their faith in Christ. Now imagine that baptism ceremony, just imagine that, okay? Talk about missing lunch, okay? It's like, forget lunch. <laughs> You're not going to be eating until dinner. But 3,000 people are getting baptized. So these 12, they go out and they preach this message of love. And they say they're baptizing everybody who places their faith in Christ. And Acts 8, you find so many stories. 27 stories, by the way, of an individual or a group of people. And one of them is 3,000 people. So it's thousands and thousands of people over these 27 encounters. They uh, place their faith in Christ and they immediately get baptized. Every single one of them. But in Acts 8, we find this story. Can we take that down for a sec? And the Ethiopian eunuch is a very powerful person. He's from Ethiopia. He's just gone to Jerusalem, and he's uh, heard about all the hubbub of, of, of the Messiah and how the Old Testament foretold this, this great man who would come and die for the sins of the world. And everybody who's placing their faith in Christ, he's watching these people get baptized. Jerusalem is just buzzing about Jesus, the Messiah, Jesus, the Messiah. And we killed him only a few days ago. And, and he, he witnesses all this. And he's going back to Ethiopia and he's searching the scriptures. Now, he doesn't have a Bible like you and I have a Bible. He has a scroll, if you've seen The Chosen, that he's holding it up. So, so this guy, Philip, one of the 12, he's able to see this. And he sees this guy studying the scriptures. And he says, hey, can I explain to you what you're reading? What are you reading? Uh, Isaiah, can I explain to you what, what Isaiah is all about? And he got up in the chariot and explained. And he led this Ethiopian to Christ. And the Ethiopian has just seen a bunch of people getting baptized, and he says, okay, I'm a believer now. I want to get baptized. Well, we don't have any water. And while they're rolling, they see this puddle of water or some kind of lake or something like that. And he goes, he says this, look at this, verse uh, 36. As they traveled along the road, they came, to see, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, look, here is water. Why shouldn't I be baptized? Right then and there. You say, they could have said, well, it's not convenient. This is, this is weird. You know, I just met you. You know, why? There's an immediacy to his, and an urgency to his, I need to get baptized. Why shouldn't I be baptized right now? Verse 38. And he gave orders to stop the chariot 
right? And there's an entourage because this Ethiopian had a lot of money and power. Then both Philip and the Ethiopian went down into the water and Philip baptized him. Isn't that great? So look, here's water. Why shouldn't I be baptized? I want to turn that on its head. And I want to say to you, hey, you've never been baptized. Huh, there's water. Look, right over there, there's some water. Why shouldn't you be baptized right here, right now? I've ended our service early. Actually, the service isn't over, right? But I've ended my time early because I've made time for you, specifically you, to get past this one moment with him. You know it's kind of a blockade. I don't care how old you are, sir, how old you are, man, how long you've been a believer. It's time to not be ashamed anymore. Let's go public. Let's put the wedding ring on the finger. Imagine if I said to my wife, well, I got to put my wedding ring. I'll wear it when I'm at home, but I'm going out and let me put the wedding ring down. Why would you put the wedding ring down, honey? Because I might see a pretty girl out there today and, and, and you know, I don't want to be necessarily associated with you. And she'd come at me with, like I said last week, scissors. You're going to cut me in places, okay, right? Because, hey, you're mine. This is my way of saying to the world, I belong to her. I'm no touch for all you ladies. I know I'm looking good and fly, and I know you want me and everything, but no. Mm -mm. I'm taken. I'm taken. I'm just kidding about that. All. I'm just, just kidding. But you know what I'm saying. I'm taken. I'm hers. I'm Elizabeth. That's what this wedding ring means. Your baptism is you saying to the world, I'm taken. I'm a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. And I'm not ashamed of who knows it. I have decided to follow Jesus. So I'm about to, what I'm going to do is I'm going to have everybody not, not stand right now. Hang on. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to offer you the opportunity. We're going to play a song and we've got a team ready to go right outside these doors, ready to get you completely ready for baptism. You'll be, you'll be ready in three minutes. Okay. So go ahead and open those doors. If you would, Maurice, we've got a team ready to go. We've got the red carpet. We're going to roll out the red carpet for you, baby. And we're going to put this down and you're going to be walking on this because this is your special day. This is the most important day of your most important event of your life over your wedding and over your graduation ceremony because it marks the most important decision of your life. You place your faith in Christ. Now, this is the outward expression of the inward connection that has begun. We're going to roll out the red carpet for you. So do this, okay? Mr. Maurice, will you take this? Roll that out for him. We're going to have everybody stand. If you would, please stand. And when I say three, when we start this song, I'd like for you to just make your way right out the aisle, go right to the back, and then go out to these doors. If you've never been baptized, you say, well, uh, I I've got my hair, and I've got what they haven't thought of everything. We've got, we've thought of everything. We got brushes, we got hair ties for you, ladies, so that if you can't fix your hair back, you can just put it back in a ponytail. We've even got feminine hygiene products if it's that time. Because we don't want there to be any excuse for you to once and for all say, I'm doing business with the Lord. I'm going public. Hey, you say, what about my family? We're going to film it. We're filming it right now for them, for them to be able to see. Yeah. Your family's going to be able to see this. We're going to take pictures. We got a photographer. If you've seen her taking pictures, we're going to take pictures of this. This is your moment. Don't hesitate. Come on. This is your moment to go ahead and say, I have decided to follow Jesus and I'm going to be baptized. You've been waiting for far too long. So I'm gonna to count to three and I don't want you to hesitate and I want you to walk back and go right into the arms of some volunteers who've got everything prepared for you. Get the t-shirt, wear it on your chest. You've decided to follow Jesus, don't hesitate. You ready? One, two, three, just go ahead, go on back. Now's your time, let's go for it. Christ is my reward. And all of my devotion And there's nothing in this world That could ever satisfy Through every trial My soul will sing so No Proud turning back I've been Are set you getting baptized free today? Christ is enough right nope. here. Christ don't say I don't know. Say yes or no. Yes, 
enough for me I believe that Christ is enough for me and everything I need is in you Lord you're everything I need Christ my all in all Christ my all in all He's the joy of my salvation. And this hope will never fail. And heaven is my hope. And through every storm, my soul will sing. Because Jesus is here. But to God be the glory, Christ is enough for me. I believe that Christ is enough for me. And everything I need is in you, Lord. You're No turning back, and I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. The cross before me, the world behind me. No turning back, no, but no turning back. The cross before. No turning back, no turning back, oh, no turning back, because Christ is enough for me. I believe that Christ is enough for me, and everything I need is in you, Lord. Turning back, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. Cause I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. I have decided. No turning back, no turning back, oh. Let's sing this old hymn together. I feel like we know it. It goes like this. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. We sing the world behind me. The world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, 
the cross before me, the world behind me, the cross before me, no turning back, no turning Amen. back, no turning, no turning back, no turning back. Come on, church, put your hands together for what the Lord is doing here in his house. Amen. We have, you can be seated. And for all of you who are concerned about us ending on time, the service is going to end on time. Thank you for staying here and celebrating with Delisa Eaton. Would you give her a hand, Delisa Eaton? I got to spend a, a moment right here finding out if she has in fact placed her faith in Christ alone. And she said yes, and has, is she willing to follow him wherever she, he leads her to go? And she said yes. And so I'm going to ask her those two questions in front of you. We have three, I believe, who've come back and two that are going to be baptized today. Uh, one wants to wait for family. So, uh, and that's, let me, if I could stop and say this uh, real quick before I ask Delisa. Uh, if there's those of you who do, in fact, want to be baptized, but you do want to have your family be here, you can let us know with the connection card in the seat back in front of you. And those of you who are online, you can let us know with the connect tab at the bottom. Just say, I want to be baptized and we will baptize you over the coming weeks. We've got plenty of water here and we'll make sure, uh, we'll keep refilling it every week uh, to make sure that you are baptized. So now to Delisa. Delisa Eaton, so proud of you for going public with your faith. This is the wedding ring on the finger. We believe that baptism does not save you or complete Jesus' salvation, but it is simply the outward expression of the inward connection and the most important moment of you following Jesus, the beginning of following Jesus. And so I wanna ask you a couple of questions. Have you placed your faith in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins? Yes. And are you willing to follow him wherever he calls or leads you to go? Yes. Then it is based on that profession that I baptize you, my sister. If you'd hold your nose, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ in baptism, raised to walk in new life. Woo! So proud of you, Delisa. Walk slowly. Slowly. Yep. Yep. Awesome. Carol. Carol. Oops, excuse me. Sorry. Just walk slowly. You step down. Right here. Perfect. All right, this is Carol Aruka. 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 <laughs> Got to roll my R's. Thank you. I'm a bad R roller. Carol, we're so proud of you. And we're honored to be a part of this moment in your life. The outward expression, the, the coming out party that I'm a follower of Jesus Christ for Carol Aruka. Carol, we're so proud of you. Let me ask you two questions. Have you placed your faith in Jesus Christ as your Savior for the forgiveness of your sins? And are you willing to follow him wherever he calls or leads you to go? Yes. Then it is based on that profession if you hold your nose. But I baptize you, my sister, Carol, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ, raised to walk in new life. Yeah. Woo! You can stand. Proud of you. So do we have three? Awesome. I'm so glad that you're doing this, Elisa. Just uh, step down into here. Sorry about that. Elisa Sanders. Alyssa, yes. Would you be seated? You can be seated. Yeah, there you go. Awesome. Perfect. You can sit back. Yeah, sit back right Yeah, there you go. Perfect. All right, Alyssa, we're so proud of you. This is amazing. And um, you have gone, you're going public with your faith. We're just so 
proud of you and, and honored to be a part of this moment. So I have two questions for you. Have you placed your faith in Jesus Christ as your savior for the forgiveness of your sins? Yes. And are you willing to follow him wherever he calls or leads you to go? Then it is based on that profession. Just hold your nose. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ, raised to walk in new life. Alyssa, so proud of you. You can step up. Yep. Well done. Walk slowly. Walk slowly. There you go. There you go. Hold on to it. Yep. Wonderful. What an unbelievable, so proud of these three. And over the course of this time, you may have been moved to do this yourself and to say, you know what, I should have taken advantage of this moment. And if you're kind of feeling that moment with the Lord, we really want to encourage you to take that step. We'll baptize you over the next few weeks. And remember that God loves you. He's so proud of you. And remember that the earthly life doesn't become a pleasurable experience and a life filled with purpose until you put your life in a blessable position by saying, you know what, I'm going to follow him. So that's a, a very, very important principle. While the gospel is that we have salvation by grace through faith, and it cannot be taken away, his love can't be taken away, us living out his purpose for our life is conditional. And the first step of that is to go public with your faith. It's his way of helping us get over being ashamed of him and coming out and saying, you know what, I'm going to live for him going forward the first act of followership. So would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, in this moment, there's some people who really need to respond, who really need to walk forward. There's many who maybe they've been baptized, but they still feel a life of purposeless, it's purposelessness. It's really because they haven't embraced your plan for the church and how you want to use them in your church. I pray that you'd move in them to join us in 20 minutes at 1230 in the theater to say, you know what? I'm done with this living in the world and being of the world. I'm going to live in the world and be not, not be of the world, but be of Christ and live to advance the church so that it can become the light of the world. God, use my life. Fill my life with purposeless, pur 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 purposeness. And would you move in their heart to want to be a part of 12, 1230 to 130, just to learn about your church. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.